My message this morning, are your rivers flowing? A few amens. Are your rivers flowing? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father. We can say, Abba, Abba, Father, our Father, heart in heaven. Glory to God. Lord, we, we're asking you by your Spirit to take control of every demonic spirit, every, every wandering spirit, every tired and weary spirit. Oh, God, take authority in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, sanctify me wholly to deliver and minister the word of truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Hebrews 3 and 4, there's a very detailed account of the unbelief of Israel. And the Bible says they could not enter in because of unbelief. That whole chapter, both those chapters deal with the unbelief in Israel. And the Bible says in Hebrews that they, this was all recorded as uh, example or testimony to us upon whom the ends of the world have come. Let us labor or desire to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. The Lord says, look at it, look at the Old Testament. Look at their unbelief. Look at what happens when you have no faith. And take it as an example. He said that you, you must learn from it. And folks, we've got to learn from what we see in the Old Testament, especially in Exodus 14, 15, 16, and 17. And I want to deal primarily with Exodus 17. You might want to open your Bibles and just leave it on your lap to Exodus 16 because we'll be referring to uh, Exodus 17, we'll be referring to that through the course of the message this morning. Paul the Apostle uh, <clears throat> says that this chapter 17, in fact, he refers to Exodus 17 in 1 Corinthians, don't turn there, but 1 Corinthians 10, 9 to 11. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and he's talking about this particular chapter in, in chapter 17 of Exodus. They were destroyed of serpents. Now all these things happen on them for examples, and they are written for us and for our instruction upon whom the ends of the world are come. Now let me try to emphasize even a little stronger how important this chapter is, how important this lesson is. It's brought out by the psalmist. Listen to it. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. They believed not his word, but they murmured in their tents and hardened and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. This is also referring to this, these episodes in chapters 15, 16, and particularly in chapter 17. It's all about, chapter 17, it's all about the struggles of God's people with unbelief. The battle in their hearts with unbelief in spite of God's gr grace, His mercy, His word, His promises and commandments, and even His threatenings. In spite of all of this, they never did come into a faith. Now, before we go into chapter 17 and try to glean some lessons from this <clears throat> about the wickedness of unbelief, let me show you <clears throat> a very uh, important truth. Now, follow me closely because this sets the the foundation for the truth that God wants to reveal to us this morning. God put this on my heart. Now listen closely. When you get past the Red Sea, your battle changes, the spiritual warfare changes, and even your enemies change. Now, you've got to see this and understand it. The Red Sea, remember, God cast all of the horses and the riders into the sea. Now, up to this time, the enemy had been an outward enemy, a visible enemy. You could see Pharaoh, you could see his chariots, you could see his enemies. And this is a type of those outward sins, these habits. Drinking, alcohol, drugs, uh, promiscuous sex, pornography, all of these gambling, all of these outward enemies that come against us. <clears throat> now, there comes a time when God says, I'm going to deliver you. And... Up to this time, their enemy can be seen. Now, when they get across the Red Sea, and they're, all their enemies are done, there come a time God deals with where your battle is not with sin, outward sin. God settles those. He, there has to come a time where that is settled. God doesn't intend for you to go through your life fighting those kind of enemies. There comes the Red Sea. There comes the death blow to your enemy. But then your battle changes when you get on the other side. 
God gets to the real issue and it's in the heart. It's, a, it's, a, it's an enemy you can't see. It's an enemy that is an inward enemy. And God takes them to himself. The Bible didn't say he took them into the promised land. He said, I took you out of the uh, Egypt and the iron furnace unto myself. Because God said, I cannot take you in until you learn to trust me. You have to get rid of all of your unbelief. And God brings them out. And their enemy changes now. You can't see this enemy. It's in the heart. And they don't know it's there. They are dancing and shouting because all of their enemies are gone. It's a wonderful thing when you can stand up and praise God and say, My battle is ended. I'm not tempted anymore with that old sin. God has delivered me. He's dealt a death blow to that kind of, even the temptation of it. It's gone. It's finished. And that's what God does. Here at Times Square, we don't believe once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. We don't believe once a drug addict, always a drug addict. We believe God puts a death blow to it, and even the desire for it is gone. But now, there's a different kind of battle now. Pharaoh represents all those strongholds of sin. And now they come, and it's only three days later, and they come to a place called Mara, where there is a, a small uh, fountain and a, probably a large pond, and they race to it, and they find it's bitter, and nobody can touch it. They can't drink it. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, Why have you brought us out of the wilderness to die? Were there no graves in Egypt? Now, folks, listen to me, please. God was very patient with these people when they were in Egypt. Because he knew that they had a big enough battle, and he said, you can't fight two wars on two fronts. God was not expecting faith out of these people. Israel had no faith whatsoever. All God acted on was their cry. Folks, that in itself is a prayer. Pastor Carter has a magnificent message on that when, when a cry becomes a prayer. And God heard the cry of Israel. There was no faith. Oh, it says when, Abra when Moses came and told them of his call, he put his hand in his breast and he pulled it out. It was leprous. He puts it in again and brings it out and it's clean. He throws his rod on the ground and it turns to a serpent. The Bible says they believed, but they didn't believe God. They believed the call of Moses. I would believe if I saw uh, a serpent. Man tells me he's called and he... His hand turns leprous and then it's clean, and I see a, a, a stick turn into a snake. I would believe God called him. They, they believed in his call, but they did not believe God. That's very apparent, very quickly. You know, we, you've got to understand, the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. It was a weak cry. It's mingled with distress and unbelief. It's a, hope, a cry of hopelessness. But you, you find all through the Old Testament... It reads, and in their distress, they cried out unto the Lord, and the Lord heard them and delivered them. Psalms 107, 6, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness into the shadow of the light, of light, and he broke their bonds in sunder when he heard their cry. They, they, they had no power over Pharaoh. They could not deliver themselves, but they cried, and God delivered at the voice of their cry. Now, I don't, if you're in bondage this morning, the first thing you do is cry. You cry out to God for deliverance. He will hear that cry. Your faith may be weak, but God will open the Red Sea. He will give a death blow to your enemies because your cry is desperate. Your cry is one of repentance. Your cry is one of hunger for, for God to break the chains and bondage in your life. I, I wonder if you're still in bondage this morning then I, I, I suggest very quickly that you cry out to him. God came down at the Red Sea, for he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth, and he heard the groaning of these prisoners. He loosened them from their appointment with death. And everywhere in my Bible I see that. Anyone who cries out to the Lord in desperation... They don't turn to man, but they turn to God with all their heart. God said, I'll hear your cry. Listen to it. For he shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also, in him that hath no helper. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. All through this book, cry, and God hears. 
God delivers. Hallelujah. But now in Exodus 17, there's a new battle here. There's a new enemy. Now, what Pharaoh could not do, unbelief did. Pharaoh couldn't destroy them. And what drugs couldn't do to you, alcohol, promiscuous sex, all of these outward things, what that did not do to you, did not destroy because the Lord delivered you, pulled you out, and, and he said, I'll restore to you all the years the canker worm has eaten, and God has delivered you, you enjoy the freedom of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness of sins and justified by his blood by faith, or, or, or by faith. Then comes the real battle. <clears throat> what Pharaoh and his iron chariots could not do, unbelief did in destroying the children of Israel. God said very clearly that in spite of all the miracles, in spite of all of the security of the blood, in spite of great deliverances from the power of their enemies, they never did believe God. And there was a reason for it. There was a secret sin. The Bible makes it very clear that they smuggled out of Egypt a shrine to Milcom and Chilean. In fact, Amos makes it very clear. He said, you took up the in, in Amos 5, 25 and 26. He, he, he said, you took up the shrine. In fact, in the original Hebrew, said, you took up the shrine of your king. <clears throat> I don't know how they smuggled it out. <clears throat> they had been worshiping this idol in, in Egypt. They smuggled it out and they took it. That shrine was with them all through the wilderness. I don't know if they had a secret tent where they had this shrine hidden from the eyes of the leadership, but all through that journey through the, through the wilderness, people had to be sneaking into that tent. They had to bring their little food offerings as they do to their false gods. They had to be kneeling. Their people were worshiping and saying, this is the God. This was the underground church. This, this is the God that's brought us through the Red Sea. Milcom and Chilion, this is the God. It's not a pedestal, because the word suggests a pedestal. And they would feed this God. They would worship this God. God said, cast ye away every man the abomination of eyes, and defile not yourself with the idols of Egypt. But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not, they did not cast away nor forsake their idols of Egypt. You'll find that in Exodus 20, verses 7 and 8. God said, I've known all along what you've done. I've seen that secret thing. I have seen it. And, and, and you've been holding on to that. And you took up it's become your king. Now, what does this all mean to us this morning? It says that you cannot be delivered from the power of sin or sheltered by the blood unless you give up. You can be sheltered by the blood, but God says, I want to deal with that secret thing. And I want to show you that one of the most tragic of all secret sins are the seeds of unbelief that are in us. Unbelief. Now, folks, you can be uh, a Christian who comes to church you can praise the Lord. You can uh, be uh, happy in the Lord. You can be a worshiper, a praiser, and even dance before God. You can do all these things and still be carrying unbelief in your heart. This is the, the, the crucial uh, message that I have to bring this morning from the Lord. In Egypt, all the hardships, all the hardships were from the visible enemy. Now listen to me, please. There comes a time when your enemy changes. And I've got to get this deeply into your heart. In the wilderness, all the hardships came from the hand of God. We had a young preacher here Tuesday night, Timothy Delina from Detroit. And he said, be careful when God's at work in your life that you go around buking the devil all the time before you know it's God or not. People are trying to bind all the time, and you may be binding the work of God. Folks, I want you to know that in spite of all their shouting and their praising, it was that cloud of fire 
and the pillar of the cloud by day and the pillar by night that led them to Marah. God knew those waters were bitter. He knew that you couldn't drink them. He was testing these people. But there are no shouters now. There are no praising people now. They're not calling on the Lord. They're calling on Moses. They have lost their whatever faith they had. It's gone. They're standing there now before the waters and say, God again, they're saying, they said it before the Red Sea. God brought us out here to kill us. Three days later, they're saying, God brought us out here to kill us. Is God with us or isn't he? Again, doubting. But I want you to know it was God that put them in that hard place. God put them there. He knew what he was doing. He knew the tree that was there was going to bring healing to those waters. But God is trying to expose to their own heart, their own vision, the unbelief that's in them. They could dance all they want, but God said, you really don't believe me. You don't trust me. And folks, this is what God's been dealing with me about. This is still the one battle that I, I fight and I show God, this is one battle I must win. I, I want to come to a place where I commit my life totally into the care and the hands of Jesus. I want to know that I have no unbelief in me, that I trust him in every area of my life. I trust him for the salvation keeping of my family. I trust him, first of all, that he'll keep me from falling, present me faultless before the throne of grace. I trust in his blood. I trust that he will keep me in all my ways. I trust that he will uh, sanctify everything that I say. There has to be a walk of faith. And God's trying to say, you think you're ready, but you're not. Oh, I dealt with that major sin, but now I want to get to the unbelief in you. I want to get to that lack of trust and confidence in me. And so he brings them to a place and he tests them. And they failed the test. It was a time of faith. It became a time of unbelief before the Lord said, the Lord, he humbled you. He suffered you to hunger, to prove the, to know what was in your heart. It was not a work of Satan. God allowed it. And some of you are going through a very difficult time right now. Going through a hard time. A testing time. And you, you, you're thinking to yourself, well, the devil has really got me in a hard place. The devil's really testing. We blame everything on the devil. We blame everything on Satan. This was not Satan. This was the leading of God. This was the leading of, of the cloud by day, right to that spot. And God let them suffer hunger. Oh, they cried. And, and, and that, that very next day, God sent quail, covered the camp with quail, and he sent manna. God had all the provision, but they had no faith. God didn't answer by faith. He was still answering to their cry. God wants to come to the place where he doesn't have to answer to a cry, but he answers to faith. It comes a time God's been showing me that. David, uh, you know, so many times God said to us, get up, why are you crying? Get up and believe me and trust me. Why do you lay before me weeping and crying when you're full of unbelief? Folks, you can cry a river of tears. Make God any kind of promise, but your heart is full of unbelief. It makes no impact with God. Tears won't move him. Prayer won't move him if there isn't faith. For without faith it is impossible to please him. And they that come to him must believe he is, that he's a rewarder of them to diligently seek him. I've got a question for you. How far will God go in allowing suffering in our lives to expose our unbelief? How far will God go? He lets you hunger. He lets you thirst. He brings you into very hard times where it looks like you are not going to make it. Everything's going to fail. And then we say, well, God has left us. And that's the problem in Exodus 17. And this is what really grieved God. They're going about saying, if God is with us, how can this happen? Where is God? Where is he? I see no signs of his blessing and anointing. We know that they go next to Rephidim. And there's been word that there's a, uh, there's a stream in Rephidim. There's a fountain. And when they get to Rephidim, there is no water. There is no air. The stream is dried up. There is nothing. Now, folks, this is, whether you get this message or not, I'm getting it. Because I am preaching to myself this morning. God's been preaching it to me all week long. Here they are again. Where they just had water marvelously healed. 
And I'm sure they packed up all of their skins and everything else with water to take them. And here they are in the same condition again. Where are the shouters? Where are the praises and the tambourines? Nobody's worshiping the Lord. We know there are at least 250 princes in Israel because later they were destroyed for unbelief. But where, where are the princes? Where is anybody going through the camp and saying, Hey, look, let's have a prayer meeting. Let's call on the name of the Lord. Great is our Lord and of great power who, who prepareth rain for the earth. Psalms 147, 5 and 8. They say, God has a river prepared somewhere. Let's seek God with all of our heart. They didn't seek God. There's no mention of prayer. In fact, they prayed to Moses. They went to Moses and said, Moses, send, give us water. He said, I'm not God. There's no one here praying. No one's calling on God. No one is remembering the past miracles and past deliverances. It's They're totally overcome by unbelief. Listen, I know had they bowed before the Lord, God would have immediately, if they had, at the first evidence of faith, God had a reservoir ready. In God's mind, a river was flowing. A river was flowing out of a rock, coming right down into their camp. They'd have to part to let the water through. More water than they could ever consume. A refreshing living water that would follow them wherever they go through the wilderness. God had a river. And that river would break into little uh, rivulets everywhere, and everywhere it would go would be life. Now, folks, here's the heart of my message. Let me talk to you about the real danger of unbelief, which, by the way, I call the most tragic of all secret sins. Now, it may show itself in the way you talk, but the seed of it is in the heart, and God has to get to the seed of it. He has to get down into the depths of the soul and pluck out the very roots of it. Unbelief blocks the flow of all your rivers. The Bible, doesn't he say the Holy Ghost will be in you a river of living water flowing to everlasting life? There is to be in us a constant flow. The psalmist called it a river of peace. In another place he called it a river of joy. There's a river of blessing. There's a financial river that flows in many godly people of all times have known what it's like to have God meet every provision. There was a flow. Years ago, God taught me how to get into the money flow to, for His work. And folks, for over 20 years now, I've been in that money flow where God has met the need. There's not a dollar debt on this church. There's not a dollar debt in any of the ministry connected with this church because God showed me years ago how important it was to get into his money flow, that there's a river that flows, and when you do it God's way, the money will be there. You do his work his way, he has to pay the bills. There is a flow of provision, there's a flow of workers, there's a flow. And folks, I ask you again, are your rivers flowing? There, there is a flowing river of prayers being answered. Are your rivers flowing? God wants those rivers to spring up. Oh, folks, nothing's going to hinder that eternal river. It's flowing. It flows from the cross. It will flow right through into eternity. But, folks, God himself stops up our rivers. I'm going to prove that to you. This has been a... a, a, a eye-opener to me in the Spirit, when God said, David, I can stop all your rivers. I, I've been there, folks. I know what it's like to God have stop up your rivers, where you look around and nothing is happening. Everything is stopped. Everything. Oh, you get along, you know you're saved, you know you're on the way to heaven, but nothing is happening. Everything is stopped. There is no peace. There is no rest other than this, 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 this general peace that God gives to those who are under the blood, but there's not that flowing peace that runs out to others and refreshes them. There's not that river of strength and power and an anointing. I've been there. I don't ever want to go back. I know what it is for the Lord to stop up my rivers. God said, I am the Lord. I'm quoting Isaiah 44, 20. He said, I am the Lord that saith to the deep, <clears throat> be dry. And I dry up thy rivers. He said, I'm the one who opens the fountains. 
and I'm the one who closed them. Now, folks, that river was locked up in that rock. It was there all the time. But their unbelief stopped the flow. That secret sin stopped the blessings. Let me prove it to you just a little further. Joel, the prophet, cried, The rivers of water he hath dried up. Joel 120. Psalm 74, 15. Thou didst break open the fountain of the flood, and thou driest up mighty rivers. I've seen God dry up some mighty rivers. Men in the pulpit and evangelists and others, pastors who were mightily used of God, they were, the rivers flew out of the blessing and salvation, multitudes being saved and healed. There was a financial flow. They weren't begging people for money. God was blessing them. But God, I've seen Him stop some mighty rivers. And those men today are nothing but dry fountains. There's not a drop of water. There's no anointing. There's no life. There's no power. He stopped the fountain. He stopped the rivers. Ezekiel 30, 12, And I will make your rivers dry. I will make your rivers dry. God stopped these mighty rivers because of secret sin. Folks, let me tell you something. If you're hiding adultery, if you're hiding pornography, if you're hiding some secret and God's been dealing with you, oh, He's loving, He's patient, He'll deliver message after message to you, and He'll allow a certain amount of blessing, but folks, the longer it goes, the more He is stopping the rivers. They begin to dry up little by little. And folks, I tell you now, it is this secret sin of unbelief above every sin that stops up all the rivers. You will never get your family to God. You will never have all the flowing of His eternal uh, resources. He said He's given us all that we need for godliness and holiness. He has everything we need for victory and power over sin. He has everything we need to go through this life without living in fear. There's a river of joy. There's a river of peace. And He wants every river to be flowing in and through your life. Bringing life to you and to everybody around you. If your rivers have stopped flowing, don't you think it's time to examine your heart and say, Oh God, is there unbelief in me? Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Israel never came out of this unbelief. They were never ready to lay down their sins. They were never ready to lay down this secret thing. Oh, to God that somebody with the zeal of God had gone into that little tent, taken that shrine and beaten it to powder. Oh, that somebody would have risen up and said, Look, this is bringing reproach. This is going to shut down the blessing. I'll tell you what, Achan stopped the flow of God's power in Israel because of his secret sin. You'll find it all through the Bible. The rivers began to dry up. Oh, folks, I, I know, I know, years ago I've been through that, over 25 years ago, and I don't ever want that dryness to look around and everywhere I see things are withering. Things are withering. Things are dying. There's less joy. There's less peace. There's less strength. There's less power. Less anointing. Little by little. And you can see it draining away. You see it. And you wonder what's wrong. What's wrong. And all along that little thing that God is after. It's been there all the time. And folks, much of it is unbelief. And I'll tell you what. If you have any secret sin, it will lead you to unbelief. It will cause you to doubt the Lord's power and His presence in your life. I know that there are people that, that you, God brought here this morning, not just visitors, but those that have been coming here maybe spasmodically, but God brought you here this morning. And I'm going to tell you right now, of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and hear it clear, if your rivers are drying, if you are not seeing God Blessing upon your life. Now, folks, there are times of trial. There are times of testing. And that's what he was doing. God was allowing all this because he was testing them. 
But I tell you, the moment you say, Lord, live or die, I'm yours. I am not going to turn my back on you. Lord, I don't care what happens. I want to trust you. I want to give you my life. And when things get hard, when things get difficult, say, oh, God, search me. Turn the searchlight of the Holy Spirit. Is there anything hidden in my life? God wants truth in the inner man, in the inner parts. He wants nothing that hinders the flow of his blessing. God wants to bless you, folks. God wants to anoint you. He wants to pay your bills. He doesn't want you to have to live constantly, absolutely constantly. Now, now folks, first thing he's going to do is to teach you how to stay within your budget. He's going to take the covetousness out of your heart. Don't ask God to open a river if you've got a covetous spirit. Ask God to heal your covetous spirit and then the river will start flowing. Hmm. I want you to go to Isaiah 41, please. I'm going to close in just a minute. <laughs> Folks, I don't want God to stop my rivers. Do you? No, I want my rivers to flow. Hallelujah. Are you ready for the good part? Hey, look this way for just a moment. <clears throat> if this morning, while you sit in this church, you make a commitment, God, I'm going to lay down my fears. I'm not going to fear what man can do to me. You know my heart. I want you. I'm going to turn to you with everything in me. And I'm going to trust you. If you just help me. I'm going to trust you with all my, I'm going to trust my problem to you, my family, this crisis that I'm in, I'm going to trust it all to you, Lord. I'm not going to question, I'm not going to murmur and complain. I'm going to believe that you'll bring me out. You know, Job came, Lord, I'll tell you, Lord, even you slay me, I'm going to trust you. You can kill me, you can take my life, but I'm going out trusting you. That's where it comes to. God, I don't know how this is going to come out. I'm not even going to ask you anymore, but I'm going to commit myself into your hand. I put my life into your hands. Now, God, I'm going to trust you. And I'll tell you, the moment you do that, the rivers are going to open. The rivers are going to open. I want you to look at verse chapter 41, Isaiah, verse 17 and 18. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. Read it with me. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Glory. Hallelujah. He said, trust me. And that wilderness you're in, you're going to see grass everywhere. I'm going to turn it into green pastures. And I'm going to have still waters beside you. And I'm going to let it flow. And it's more than enough that you can handle. And everybody around you is going to be blessed with the river that flows out of you. Turn right to Isaiah 43. Now, if the word doesn't deliver you, I sure can Isaiah 43, begin to read verse 19. If you have King James, read verse 19 with me. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me. The dragons and the owls because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. Hallelujah. Will you stand? Glory to God. Who gives the water? Who opens the fountains? Who makes the rivers to flow? God says, I'll do it if you'll trust me. Hallelujah. I want everybody in this building to raise your hands right now 
and ask God to forgive your unbelief. Let's for ask God to forgive our unbelief. Lord, forgive our unbelief. We're stopping up our rivers, Lord. We're stopping up our rivers. We're hindering the flow of your anointing and blessing. God, forgive our unbelief. Folks, say it loud and clear to God. Say it from your heart. Lord, forgive my unbelief. Take away my fear. Take away my unbelief. God, give me faith to trust you. You're going to, you're going to make a river in my wilderness. You're going to open up a fountain of blessing in my wilderness. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Glory be to Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to open these altars now, specifically for those that are here this morning. You say, Pastor David, I'm in a very, very dry place, and I'm being tested probably more than I've ever been tested in my life. And, and, and my rivers, you're going to have to admit it now, my rivers are not flowing as they should. I don't know what river it is, but they're not flowing as they should. Now, I want you to come down here right now and ask God to open your rivers. And up in the balcony, you can go to either stairs on side either side and come down any aisle and folks if you're not right with God if you're backslidden come and join these that are coming right now God sent you here to deliver you God sent you here to change you and touch you by his power God wants to open your rivers hallelujah he's going to let it flow hallelujah Lord open up a fountain this morning those are coming move in close please make room for those that are coming move in tight if you will please hallelujah to all of you that are have made a move to the front or to the aisles. Listen closely to me, please, because I believe I have a special word from the Holy Spirit for you. The Lord knows what you've been through. He knows where he wants to take you. But you've got to be willing to follow him by humbling yourself right now before him and asking God, to take control of your life. Please let him take control in every area. Don't hold up any area of your life. It has to be a full surrender. Look at me, please. A full surrender of that secret sin that God's dealing with you about. Folks, God doesn't want to hold up that river. You know God would never let a baby die that was thirsty. He would have never let a grandpa, grandma. Nobody was going to die in the hands of God. But all the grief that it caused him. There would have been, there, there would have been such joy, would have been such a testimony had they believed God. And just through their faith and confidence in Him, they could say, now I know. It's not just through Moses, but through my faith. You can't rest on the faith of a pastor or a friend. God wants you to have your own particular faith. It has to be something you possess, something that's yours. God wants that to be given to you. He will, he will enlarge your faith. You just bring to him what you have and say, oh God, I am weak. I am frail, but I want to live a life of faith. I know I can't please you. See, you, you and I try to please God by, uh, by, by just doing special things for him, making him promises, uh, reading so many scriptures or praying and doing all these things. And God, God says, look, if you're going to, if you'll make a commitment to lay down everything that's hidden in your life, if you'll make a commitment, say, Lord, I know this has to go, including your unbelief. Say, Lord, I know that this has to go. I can't hold it any longer because all it has brought you is a wilderness. All it's brought you is pain. All it is bringing you is sorrow. And the Lord wants to bring you a river of joy and peace now. Make a commitment, Lord, it's yours. Take it from me. Here's my unbelief. Take it from me. Here's that secret thing in my heart. Take it, Lord, I give it to you. And I'll tell you, when God sees that, he moves mightily. Hallelujah. First thing he'll do, he'll open a river. He'll open that river of faith. He'll open that river of joy. And then he brings forth the river of peace. Hallelujah. Folks, I don't think there's anything greater on this earth than to go through the day been able to look anybody in the face and to go into the secret closet and look God in the eye. 
And you know his favor is upon you because there's nothing hidden. God wants that openness. He wants to open up that fountain, but your heart has to be ready to receive that. How many are ready to lay everything down at his feet right now? Raise your hand. Keep your hand raised there right now. And I want you to pray this with me right out of your heart. Jesus, take my sin, every hidden thing, including my unbelief, and my doubts, and my fears. I acknowledge them, Lord, to be terrible sin, ugly sin, hateful sin, exceedingly sinful. I repent, Lord. Take my sin. I yield it to you, Lord Jesus. Take every hidden thing. Turn on the searchlight. Probe deep into my heart. Bring out everything unlike you, Jesus. I truly repent. I turn to you, Lord, with the little faith that I have. And I ask you, forgive my unbelief. And give me a river of faith from your heart, Jesus, beginning now. Now raise both hands and thank him. Just thank him with both hands raised. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. You're good to us, Lord. You said if you come to me, I will no wise cast you out. I will hear you and I will answer you. Glory to Jesus. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.